tonight we have a legend, the wonderful Vinny Poncia. The man has worked with legends from Franette to Kiss. Where's everybody? We're we're live. You guys are here. You're beautiful. Artists on record. Your ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artist. I have a legend, and tonight this legend. He's going to tell me some life lessons in life, but he's worked with many Ronettes. Well, don't forget now, I've had three wives, so oh. I'm a little more experienced than you are. Now. You know what, Vinny? Three wives and you worked at Rock Legends. Now, don't touch that dial. Uh, thank you, Seth. Great to be here. And Kenny uh, told me so much about you. I was anxious to actually get this done, you know. Really I'm happy to be here. You really? have to have, he said, you have to do this show because what he does in editing it and gives it to you, it's like a gift that you always have. Show it to your grandkids, which is a, a metaphor for, <laughs> for whatever. <laughs> it's all fun and games till somebody gets pregnant, Vinny. <laughs> fun and games but Vinny I am so glad you hit you don't understand something first of all when Kenny even told me your name I'm like no way I get the because your name has been in my world forever forever records that I had I because back in the day I would and to this day vinyl is back I grabbed these records right and I would read the credits but I listened to these, this music they were storybooks of our lives so then I, here I am I'm going to show you how example how Stefan would do it. He'd listen to these records like this and open up the gatefold uh -oh. and look, look at the stars. And then I'm looking, and I and I love songs like on Ringo Starr's, this Ringo Starr record, which is a great right. album cover. And then you go into like All My Mind. You go, God, what a great song. And you go, Jim Kelton is on it, Billy Preston, Klaus Vormann's playing bass, right? Then you go, Vinnie Pond's here. R. Starkey wrote the song. Ooh. Then again, I go, Devil Woman. The same thing. Ringo's playing drum. Jim Keltner, Klaus Foreman, all these incredible people. Tom Scott's on the horns. Richard Starkey. Then it goes V. It's Poncia. And it's right here for you people. Yeah, that's, that's, right? That's, that's, and then yeah. you make me feel like dancing. Another, another thing that you might know of. I don't know if you know these songs. But I'm going to tell you I, that you wrote these songs. It's crazy. I even remember them. <laughs> take, take us back. I mean, it's rock and roll started for you. Well, we grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. <clears throat> Peter Anders, or Peter Andrew, Peter Anders was, well, we, <clears throat> we had this group called the Vidells. This was like in the late 50s and so. And uh, we had a local record out that we put out, and it did pretty well, actually, went to number one in Providence, mainly because my whole family would call in and request it, and they would go buy it. You know, I sold like about 5,000 copies locally. So we were excited about that. Yeah. So we had a connection with this uh, a friend of my family's lucky call in New York City who was at Southern Music. And they had Buddy Holly and a lot of other people. So we hooked up with him in New York. And we got our first uh, recording contract with Joe Sherman and JDS label who used to produce Paul Anker and Connie Francis. And he was a great songwriter. He wrote Graduation Day, him and his brother Joel and Noel Sherman. I have to tell you a funny story about yeah. After we had our first local record out, we had we were doing some other things. I was in the show band working at the Copa, like a lounge band, and Peter was doing some other stuff. But we got together. He went to New York, and he stayed at the Forest Hotel. So he stayed at the Forest Hotel, and in the lobby all night hanging around were different musicians and publishers, and there was hanging around the lobby who used to live there during the week was a man named Doc Palmas. To be a successful songwriter, you have to write songs. But, you know, someday you're in the street and somebody is singing the song that you've written. You know, you want to go over to that person and say, hey, you know, I wrote that song, but they think you're some kind of nut, so you never do it. <laughs> yes, legend. <laughs> Doc Palmas, okay? And now, we had grown up with, you know, how many hit songs he's written. And so uh, Peter made friends with him and started playing some songs for him. And uh, he was duly impressed. You know, he said, you know what? I'm going to go up to Hill and Range, is with, where he was a staff writer at that time. 
and you come up and you know you play some songs and stuff and maybe you know maybe we can get you a gig up there writing songs i said well, imagine that getting paid to write songs at that time the uh, uh, doc was there uh, otis blackwell uh, you know guys who were working there uh, kenny rankin uh, a lot of guys who were writing a lot of hits for a lot of people at that time otis elvis right this it was uh, they owned Elvis Presley music Hill and Range. Elvis part, uh, was part of that. So Peter goes up there with Doc the day before I was doing something else, and <clears throat> talks to them and they listen to the song. They said, "Great, great, we'll give you a deal here. We'll give you fifty dollars a week to write songs." And we said, "Wow, imagine that!" Because we had moved from Providence to New York, you know, after being in Providence and you know just looking to do anything, uh, give me a reason to stay in New York. What a great reason, you know. We had a job working at Hill and Range with guys like Doc Palmas, Morty Schumann, Otis Blackwell, all, all these great artists. Burt Backworth was on the seventh floor. Lieber and Stola, who used to work at, at all these places. And so he calls me up at night and he says, and I met him uh, that night, and, and he said, listen, we get a job at Hill and Range. We're staff writers. They're going to pay us. They, give, they offer me $50. We offered $50 a week. So I said to him, well, did you tell him about me? Like I was your partner. We wrote all these things. So no, I didn't say anything because I was like too afraid to like upset it. He said, but tomorrow I told Doc and Doc called him up. They said, they're going to bring you up tomorrow. So I said, great. So I came the next day and the both of us went up to Hill and Range now. I met Paul Case, who was the general manager there, the professional manager. He ran the, ran up, ran the place. And they said, and he said, I want to introduce you to my partner, Vinny Poncia. He, we wrote all these songs together. Paul says, great, we'd love to have the both of you here. He said, you could split the $50. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you can split the fifty dollars. <laughs> I thought we were getting fifty dollars a piece. We had to yeah. split. The, we got twenty-five dollars a piece <laughs> for writing songs at Hill and Range in the next room from Doc Thomas. And our uh, room rent, we stayed at the Forest Hotel, uh, yeah. a legendary hotel right on Forty Nine Street. The room went. The room rent where we stayed was forty nine fifty a week, and we were making collectively fifty. So we had five, <laughs> fifty cents, you know, to eat like a you know wherever Tad Steakhouse for dollar nineteen and stuff. Yeah, so that was the funniest, the funniest <laughs> moment. He said, "Oh, welcome, Vinny. Well, we don't. Yeah, you guys would be great together. Split the fifty dollars." <laughs> and that was my first venture into the big. And this was the Brill Building, you know. This is when yeah, George legendary Irving Berlin, you know, you know, at that point. A great story. In the Brill Building, what was the whole vibe? Was it just like the whole... It, it, the Brill Building, when you, mm -hmm. you know about the Brill Building. Yeah, of course. Yeah, take and, like, and Every floor, there were different... Like, Libra and Solar were on the 7th floor. Elvis Presley and Hill and Range was on the 11th floor. There were different record companies, smaller record companies, Big Top, and, and, and they were there. So every day, and there was a, uh, two restaurants. One was Jack Dempsey's on the left. And on the right was a place called the Turf. So uh, everybody would gather in the Turf, people who were unknown or just starting, and the people who were already famous used to hang around in Jack Dempsey's because nobody could afford to go to Jack Dempsey's. Yeah. And every day, you know, you'd be out there in the back rack, we're getting out of a car, Jackie Wilson, here comes the crest, let's go here, we're having lunch with, you know, Don Covey and, and all these up and coming groups from Brooklyn coming in. And every day was like that, you know, we would lived right across the street on 49th Street at, at the Forest Hotel. You get up in the morning, you go on hanging around at the uh, the uh, the surf at the turf restaurant, and then before you know it, somebody's walking in. Oh, you know that? Oh, that's uh, uh, oh yeah, remember uh, you know that song? Hey, little girl, and I, that's D D Clark. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, oh, hi, D. You know, and they come over and they talk to you, and like, and, that, and that's was the breeding ground, you know, for everybody in Brooklyn, because that's where everybody migrated from, all the groups, and they went to, you know, that was their Mecca. That's what they, they you know, they aspired to do. That was the, asp you know, the inspiration, and that's the aspiration for uh, uh, aspiring for, to, to be there with those people in that environment. And we actually were there, and we belonged, because we actually worked for Hill and Rage Music.
I mean, twenty five dollars a week apiece. But hey, <laughs> did you end up getting a raise? Did you end, did you end up giving well, you a raise? That, what, yeah, well, that's how it works. Like you, you, you get that, and then you work for a while. I don't know if you know the break, how that works at publishers in those yeah. days. Everybody, yeah. the song pluggers, you know, like Snuffy Garrett, who produced Bobby V, and say like who else he produced, would come by, would make a trip to New York. And we'd go to, uh, you know, <clears throat> Alden Music where Carol King, that was right up the block. They were in 1650, Neil Sedaka. And they would go and look for material. Hey, I got a session with Bobby V coming up. And and your professional manager at the publishing company would say, okay, we need songs for Bobby V. We need songs for Jimmy Clanton. We need songs for this, this, this. And you would have a list of yeah. different kind of artists that everybody, all the, all the little cubicles would be writing for. So if you got an, a, a B side on a Jimmy Clanton record, maybe you got you know seventy five dollars a week. Yeah. And at that point, he would also happen to be good friends with Phil Spector. Baby, baby, I'll get down on my knees. And when Phil would make a record, he would always come to see Paul Case. Paul Case had an old <clears throat> phonograph, you know, and Phil would play every new record before he put it out. He would come to, to Paul Case because he had an office also on, on 63rd Street on the east side. He was still in New York and, and California. And he would play all Phil's records before it comes out because his theory was if it sounds good on this horrible record player that Paul Case has, I know I got a great record. <laughs> so one day he introduced us to Phil. You know, they sat around talking. And eventually, at that time, Phil was uh, was and Ellie and Jeff Barry and Ellie Greenwich. You know, they were like kind of like parting ways. So he was looking for diff different people to work with. So uh, we got together with Phil, and uh, we started writing songs for the Ronettes. Uh, like and then the uh, I think the salary went to one fifty a week. Then we went up to seventy five dollars a piece a week. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, now we could eat at the at Jack Kings. Dempsey. Because of Kings now. <laughs> oh yeah. But this but every little every little step you took along this road, every every little every little milestone, every little bridge that you crossed always made you feel so good about something that you always wanted to do. And and not only me feeling that way, but the Kenny Vances. Looking for an echo. And the Jane the Americans. Impressed. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. And the Johnny Maestros. And all, all, all the people that were coming into New York. We loved it. We didn't care if it was $25 a week. We would have given them $25 a week. To, I mean, you're going to work next to all these people writing songs. You're going to be in this environment. It was your own little world. It was like... Times Square in that area, 49th Street from 42nd to 57th Street. And those blocks, there was some amazing, amazing young people creating them. I and you know the you know the history of you know Carol and Jerry, Barry and Cynthia, Neil and uh, you know Neil Sadaka, Howie Greenfield, plus all every other every other people in the Bill building, just, Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller. It's crazy what you mean. Yeah. I mean, these pe these people were there every day though. See, it was every day and you like you morphed into this, like you became like, oh hi Bert, hi Bert. oh yeah. yeah, how you guys doing, you know, and stuff like that. And so that's the way it really started. I mean, for us, I mean, we were just two kids from Providence, and you know, I mean, our mothers and fathers would have to send us a hundred dollars every once in a while. <laughs> but Doc Palmas was greatly, greatly responsible for us starting. I mean, his his generosity, you know, because he'd be in he'd be up all night and we'd be in the in the lobby. There's pictures in his of us sitting, sitting in the lobby writing song. He never went to sleep, you know. And so we, you know, we used to go to Madison Square Garden with him. He wanted to go to see the fights and we would take him over there sometimes in his in his chair or help him over there. And he was very, very instrumental and very generous in taking care of these two young kids from Providence who were, you know, and just <clears throat> amazing and awe of anybody and everybody that was around us. He was, to this day, I, I owe him a great deal. I was never one of those happy cripples who stumbled around smiling and shiny-eyed. I was going to be the first heavyweight boxing champion on crutches, a one-punch knockout killer, extraordinary and talented and virile man that ever lived. 
Who was he like? What kind of person was he? He was so. Doc Palmas was just, he was just lovable. He was just a big teddy bear that you loved, smart guy, hip, cool, all those things, you know, great blues singer. He had an innate feel for that, you know. He was just, he was a, he's a down to earth guy, you know. He was just, what? He was, the, he was just, the, he was a blues singer, you know, but a genuine blues singer, you know. I mean, he was just, it's like, you know, one of those guys who, and he was a great songwriter. And Marty, Sh- Marty Schumann, his partner, was equally, equally as talented and, and special in his own way. There were some of the songs that he wrote, Marty. Uh, it was just a great time. And all the people that we got to meet at that early stage, this is like 1962 or something wow. like that. This is even just. You know, before the Beatles, before you know, the British invasion, yeah. Why we're still writing songs for like Barbara Lewis and people like that, you know, and, and they had a label, Big Top, Johnny and the Hurricanes had records out on that, and and uh, Ray Peterson and uh, Curtis Lee. Uh, they were Phil actually produced a couple of them early on. Uh, Corina, by I love Corina. By Ray Peters. I don't know if you remember any of these records. I know these songs. Yeah, you, you know the music. And, pretty little about. angel eyes by pretty Curtis Lee. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. The Phil Spector <laughs> actually produced those two records, but never really want. He, he loved the idea, but he never really wanted to take credit for it. But he, he just like, yeah, I did that. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote oh. Spanish Harlem. You know, but those like. What Phil, you know, Phil Spector did? Oh yeah, he produced those records. No, but but he, he, those he, were for Big Top Records. Big Top Records was a subsidiary of Hill and Range. Mm. You know, and he produced those records. Like, it's, it's wow. so funny. I mean, Phil Spector. So how funny. did he? Would he? But he? How did he? Would he? Because come Phil was, a, because Phil's office was on Sixty Third Street. Mm-hmm. Phyllis Records when it first started, his first records. You know, when he first started, and he grew up in the same environment as we did. Only earlier with Jerry and Mike, uh, Jerry Lieber and Mike Stola, Doc Palmas. Uh, uh, all the guys at Atlantic Records. Phil was all part of that scene early with Ahmed Erdogan and stuff. Before he moved to Los Angeles, he was- But he was he young, was right? How old? He was, how old was he then? He was then? maybe eight, 20 years old. That's crazy. 20 it's years so old. You know, he was still recording. He was still living in New York when I was working with him. He hadn't moved to Los Angeles yet. He was still living in New York. So- uh, this is this was the environment. I mean, I mean, it sounds like you know, like <clears throat> something that you would make up. You'd write for a film, like how you it know. should be a film. Well, I mean, they've tried to do it a million times, but it's. It, I mean, the people that were. Yeah. I mean, little. I mean, we, like, we would just be sitting in the turf all day. Everybody kept writing. So, oh yeah, I got a great idea for the song. I remember this. I was sitting there one day, and there was this guy that used to come in with a acoustic guitar. It was kind of like. Like almost like the Willie Nelson guitars that were yeah. like beat up and stuff. And, up and, stuff and, and uh, I met him and he said, Vinnie, come on, I want to play your song. I think Atlantic Atlantic wants to record this song. Uh, it's a great Don. Don, his name is Don Covey. So uh, he starts playing me the song, you know, I said, a chain, chain, chain. Chain of Fool. Oh, I said, that's a great song. I love that song, don't He said, yeah, they want to do that Atlantic with, uh, I think, uh, somebody, Aretha Franklin, they want to do, they want to do it with Aretha Franklin. Well, I'm not being weak, yeah. I said, well, that's great. And he starts playing it on the acoustic guitar, like his his soulful acoustic. This is in the middle of a restaurant, like, and I'm, I said, you know, I'm not going crazy because we're all we all yeah. trying to dip our toe in the water. But he, you know, we don't know. He doesn't know that's gonna, you know, you know what that began for him. But you know, he's just listening to him playing it and singing it. Those se- seminal moments of just like, I mean, it was just later on. You say every time I hear that record, I'm in the turf and Don Covey's playing for me on this broken guitar, and he's playing, and he's singing the song. You know. <laughs> And later on, of course, he did so much. He's such a, yeah. he's a great, great talent. I, I mean, a but lot of people work with him. I mean, these are you guys are the legends behind the legends. It really, really. Well, I mean, it was it was hard to explain. It wasn't uh, 
uh, <clears throat> it wasn't a like a rivalry or something mm. like that. It was it was more you know somebody throwing the gauntlet down or lifting the bar. You know, oh, you know, it's, you know, it happened all over the music business. Not just not just us. It happened with you know uh, Pet Sounds and Sergeant Pepper. Everybody was you know. And that was the great thing about it. Everybody was always trying to raise the bar. You know, we wrote songs a certain way. Then when we started writing at the Brill Building, there was two or three uh, <clears throat> partnerships around us. Guys like Otis Blockwell, Kenny Rankin, you know, Johnny Jungle Tree, John Leslie McFarlane, a great songwriter in his own right. And you would hear their songs and you would say, wow, we know we know what we got to do. We got It's got to be as good as that or better. You know, mm -hmm. so, so it would everybody had everybody was inspired to, you know, to, to pick up their game. And said it was it's an amazingly, I mean, it was like, like Artie Rupp used to say, it was like a garden where all these seeds were just thrown out and they all started sprouting, you know. Yeah. And that little yes. environment and that 20 block radius. It was the most exciting time I've ever spent in my life to this day. And I've been, you know, with the Beatles and Elvis and everybody, but that time. For for creative people, it was it was an amazing opportunity for a lot of people to take advantage it's, of, and they did. It, well, you're a kid too. At the same time, you're learning. You're oh, yeah, we're like time. 19 years old, you know, 20 years old, but you know, trying to figure out, you know, yeah, we're just trying to figure it out, you know. And then you run into this guy, and then next thing you hear Johnny Maestro, you hear that voice say, "Wow!" <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> Johnny Jimmy, Maestro, what, beautiful. <laughs> right, or the sky on his record comes out, and you say, "Wow." I mean, what is that all about? And we had a great lead singer too, Peter Anders, who was with our group uh, of Vidal's and later on with the with the trade ones. New York's a lonely town. The but it was just one, you one know, <clears throat> one thing after another that just inspired you. You got up and look. You, and Phil was the same. Everybody was the, cut from the same cloth because. Phil would call me up one day. He said, "Come over here. I want to play something for you." So I go. I go over. Uh, he was at. The, I think it was at the Plaza Hotel. So he's got acoustic guitar. He said, "I want you to hear this. This is a new song that just came on. I love this song." And he starts playing. Do you believe in magic? So listen to this line. It's like trying to tell a stranger about a rock and roll. Do you believe him? And he was just floored by that. And that's the way it was. Somebody because it was such there was such a variance of talent and it was all spread out and it came from different places and different inspirations and stuff like that. It wasn't like the cookie cut every role, everybody wrote the same song, you know, you know, starting to have the singer songwriters we're going with John Sebastian because from from Hill and Range, we moved on to Kama Sutra after that as, as uh, a staff writers too. But it was a, it was a, it was that that's that was a wonderful time. I mean, John Sebastian, huh? And then it just yeah, John Sebastian did a lot. I mean, Kenny yeah. Rank, I mean, it was, it was a friend of ours at that time. He used to, it was a little Johnny Jungle Tree, <laughs> John Leslie McFarlane, who, who wrote uh, "Stuck on You" for Elvis, and he wrote "Little yeah. Sister." <laughs> with more little sister, you know. and that 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 line. No, 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 little sister, little children. I'm sorry, oh, little children, little okay. children. Yeah, you know, just those. These guys would come in. We would work all day. Then at six o'clock, when everybody, all the office people, used to go home, that's when all the wolves came out. We'd all come upstairs. Everybody come upstairs. Now we'd sit around the piano. Let me, and then you play your new songs and stuff like that. And J Johnny Jungle Tree was great. We used to call it, his nickname was Jungle Tree. John Leslie McFarlane. He actually produced the first Aretha Franklin album. Wow. But he was a great song. And he used to sing. His version of Stuck on You, how he wrote it for Elvis, you know. Hot in the kitchen, hot in the hall, ain't gonna do you no good at all. I mean, we just like sit there, you know. I mean, these, I mean, pre precious moments. They said, well, why do you write a book? It does nothing to book. I could never write it down. You just had to be there. Hot in the kitchen, hot in the hall, ain't gonna do you no good Bobby Scott came up one day. He said, listen, I got a song coming out from the Hollies. I, I, I really like it. I hope they don't screw it up, you know. The road is long. You know, <laughs> the road is long with many a winding turn. You know. What? Incredible. Uh, uh, these were just guys. I mean, we were just guys hanging around, you know. You know, it, it was just, it was just. She ain't heavy. You know. He ain't heavy. He's my yeah. brother. What a great. I just, uh, yesterday, <laughs> on driving in the car, 
came on Sirius Radio, and I'm driving, and it, the song to this, it's just timeless. This music because it takes you to another place. And the guys that wrote it, that's just like in your office or when they're off, and they're just playing all this stuff. Everybody's <laughs> playing all those songs. It was, you, you know, you you don't say wow. I, you know, it was like it was just how, how, wow. What what about the thing where you just said to me right now? I hope those guys don't screw it up. How many times have you written a song? And well, thinking, of course, that's what everybody was because the guys who you know, guys who probably said they were very talented. You know, there were these guys were talented guys. Jock Palmer, Morty Schumann was a brilliant arranger. You know, when they wrote Suspicion, <clears throat> that seven four bar in, in the middle of it. Suspicion torments my heart. Suspicion. Don, 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 don. So that's like a seven four bar that nobody was doing that stuff but you just took it that's how you learn you say wow what was that morty and morty said well it's seven four this is how it goes and you said wow this is from i mean you're learning from you know the guys you know who who you know invented this stuff you yeah know? yeah just sitting with jerry lieber and mike stoll is unbelievable the same thing you know just you know sitting with those who, cats who, huh well, uh, we were writing, and we wrote New York's a Lonely Town. I forget what song we had. We had uh, Redbird with uh, Jerry and Mike, and then I uh, wrote this other song, and then he would look at it, and he said, Vinny, this is, this is uh, time and mine. I said, yeah, it's a rhyme. He said, that's not a rhyme. That's a bastard rhyme. This man, you, know, you couldn't figure another word to come up with time. You had to say mine. Yeah. It was, <laughs> this Jerry Lima talking to me, you know, he said, Come up with another rhyme with that. You know, <laughs> and then he started laughing, you know, and then the guys would like, and I'd look at him like, well, you know, because he was my, he was, these guys were all our mentors, you know. Yeah. <laughs> It's my you can figure that out. Oh, you had to go to mine, or you can't rhyme crime. You don't know what another one, you know. Well, and they used to laugh with each other because we were the kids. So they were then they said, No, don't worry about it. You know, you know. They give you a hard time on that. It's just Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoll, you know what I mean? You know, it's not, you know. <laughs> but busting the chops is a part of the whole thing as well. Yes, it's an, it's a, you know, it's the initiation, you know. It's, 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 <laughs> and it's, it's a little the, love. Those with, those are the those are the great times in the sixties and, and uh, with especially with Phil and remember after he cuts love and feeling he's in Los Angeles he calls me up on the phone he said I got to play this we had we go we used to go to, to uh, New York to uh, to Los Angeles and record a Gold Star on the songs that we wrote like Best Part of Breaking Up and Do I Love It with Phil and I used to play on the sessions. And then uh, we I came home, and then uh, he stayed in, and he, and he cut, and he, so he calls me up. He said, "I got to play you something." Oh, I love the feeling, baby, baby. I'd get down on my knees for you. I said, "He said you listen." I said, "So I listen." But you never close your eyes anymore. And I say, "Is that at the right speed?" <laughs> you never close your eyes anymore. I say to Phil, because you know, you don't know what medley sounds like at the beginning. I'm that saying, low. is that the right speed? He said, Yeah, that's the right speed. What are you talking about? Of course it's the right speed. I said, Wow, it sounded like it was like, like you know, when you slow a record down, because because you know, that's the first time I heard it. You know, you're really not used to, that's how how inventive he was. Whatever he did was always something, in my opinion, different and special. I'm talking about him as a songwriter, producer, and artist, and everything else is whole nother story but you know i remember you never close your eyes. i thought that, i thought he was playing a 45 at 33 <laughs> i felt so embarrassed when he said that's the right that's the right tempo and then he played the rest of it i told you i'm sorry he said, <laughs> funny things like it that. is funny i mean these are fabulous stories tidbits of these classic songs which it's so funny to see it being made to hear it being made and come come alive yeah before it even comes out you know who's well, i'm listening to it. i'm not saying to myself well this will be the most performed song in bmi history yeah, right? <laughs> i'm not thinking that i'm no. just thinking well, is, is that the right speed phil <laughs> <laughs> Vinny, don't go nowhere we're going to sign off but everybody who's watching give us a thumbs up make sure you subscribe and you know there's going to be a part two much more of Vinny to come along because there's too many stories we will see everybody later we love okay. you Mwah. bam